we discuss some of the most groundbreaking technology. We'll continue with presenting inventions that, for various reasons ranging from corporate interests to governmental interventions, never made it to the public eye, pushed into obscurity despite their potential to revolutionize our world. In the annals of experimental physics and fringe science, Few figures are as enigmatic as Thomas Townsend Brown. His work on anti-gravity technology, which began in the early 20th century, has sparked decades of debate, fascination, and skepticism. Brown's exploration into electrogravitics, the study of electrically charged systems' gravitational behavior, led him to develop what he claimed to be an anti-gravity device. a concept that could revolutionize our understanding of physics and transportation. Thomas Brown's journey into anti-gravity research began with his fascination with the Biefeld-Brown effect, a phenomenon he discovered as a young student. This effect, named after Brown and his mentor, physicist Dr. Paul Alfred Biefeld, suggested that electrically charged capacitors exhibited a small thrust in the direction of the positive pole when suspended in a vacuum. Brown hypothesized that this thrust was due to an interaction between the electric field and the gravitational field, a theory that laid the groundwork for his later experiments. Brown's anti-gravity device, often referred to as a gravitator, was based on the principles of electrogravitics. The device typically consisted of a set of capacitors and electrodes, where high-voltage electric charges were used to create an ionic wind, which Brown believed could produce a propulsive force. In his experiments, Brown demonstrated that when voltage was applied, the device moved in the direction of the positive electrode, an effect he attributed to anti-gravity. Throughout the 1950s and 1960s, Brown conducted a series of public demonstrations of his anti-gravity devices. These demonstrations often involved disc-shaped objects, which would levitate or move when subjected to high-voltage charges. The apparent defiance of gravity by these devices captured the imagination of the public and attracted the interest of the U.S. military. Brown's work was seen as potentially groundbreaking for aerospace technology offering the prospect of aircraft and spacecraft that could defy gravity and maneuver in unprecedented ways. Despite the intrigue surrounding Brown's work, his claims were met with significant skepticism from the scientific community. Critics argued that the forces observed in Brown's experiments were not anti-gravity, but rather a well-understood phenomenon known as ion wind or electrostatic thrust. This effect, where ions are transferred from one electrode to another, creating thrust, was known to be far too weak to account for the kind of propulsion necessary for anti-gravity flight. Thomas Brown's work on anti-gravity devices has left a lasting legacy, shrouded in mystery and controversy. After his death, much of his research fell into obscurity with detailed information about his experiments and findings remaining elusive. Some believe the CIA took all of his research and erased anything left to the public. Cavity Structural Effect Viktor Grebenikov was a self-taught entomologist from Russia. His journey into the unknown began with a fascination for the natural world, particularly the insect kingdom which he believed held secrets to extraordinary powers, including anti-gravity. The cornerstone of Grebenikov's discovery was the cavity structural effect, CSE, a concept he derived from closely observing the structure of bee nests and the behavior of insects. So I began researching what he had discovered, and I got out my pendulum to see if there was any way I could um, validate or add to this field of research and I was very surprised by what I found. So the first thing that I did was I found a bunch of June bug carcasses and dissected them taking off the elytron which is the the uh, shell that goes over the wings that they lift when they're going to fly. 
Then I took these shells and began arranging them in different directions and distances and different patterns. And what I found is if I took all the, uh, the shells and I laid them out on the table, I would get no reading off them at all. And if I spread them out, I would get no reading off them at all. But if I started to line them up, I turned them open side up, so they're like little bowls, and I started to line them up and gave them a certain spacing, I would start to get a negative ion charge off of them. This arrangement here I have inside of a CD case glued in so it cannot be disturbed. But if I had these all pointed in, that I get a negative ion charge over this. And I cannot have them touching either, but I get a negative ion charge, like a static charge over this. It cannot be blown by, by blowing on it. Uh, it doesn't spray, but it is a negative ion charge. Delving deeper into this phenomenon, Grabenikov collected parts of the bee nest and began experimenting. He observed an unusual heat emanation from the honeycomb structures, a sensation that could not be detected or measured by conventional scientific instruments. This observation led him to theorize about the existence of a force field generated by the geometric configuration of the honeycombs, a field capable of influencing the surrounding environment in ways not previously understood by science. Grabenikov's investigations took a significant turn when he examined the chitin shells of insects under a microscope. He discovered an unusually rhythmic, extremely ordered structure that seemed to defy gravity. When he attempted to place two of these chitin plates together, one plate hovered in the air for a few seconds before aligning itself with the other. This observation was the first step toward understanding the anti-gravitational properties of certain natural structures. Convinced of the potential of his discovery, Grabenikov embarked on a project to harness the cavity structural effect for human use. He constructed a platform with thousands of chitin shells attached to its underside, creating what he claimed was an anti-gravity vehicle. According to Grabenikov, this vehicle could travel at speeds of up to 1,500 kilometers per hour and reach heights of 300 meters off the ground. More astonishingly, the device supposedly made the rider invisible from below and encased them in a bubble-like force field that nullified inertia and dynamic pressure. I tried offsetting each of the rows so that this one was down in between so that they'd be staggered like this and I did not get any ion charge off that. But if I put them like this, and I check the spacing on it, I had to make myself a grid here. And from the centers of them, it was one inch down and half inch across. What I discovered with this arrangement was that if it is pointing perfectly north, let's just say that that's, that's north. If it's pointing perfectly north, there is actually no ion charge in this at all. But if this moves slightly westward of pure north, using the points as our, as our point, a strong positive ion charge builds up over this device. And that strong ion charge, as you go toward the west, will gradually weaken and then dramatically weaken as it is facing straight west. What is the pitch of the, of the plane? And so by the signal immediately dropping off, if an insect can detect the ion fields, they can detect that they are no longer a flying level because that field will drop off. One of the first experiments I did was I studied the flight of the June bug and the angle of the wing uh, protector, the, the overlay uh, shell. And so I replicated the angle that it is in during flight and glued it onto this measuring cup here. And then what I wanted to do was to measure to see if there was an ion field over it. What I have is the ability, if my body wants something, I can pick up a pendulum like this and I will get small twitching that will cause the pendulum to either go clockwise, which indicates that my body wants it, or counterclockwise 
indicating that my body does not want it. Now to find out if I, how I um, am reacting to the, a possible negative ion charge, I have over here a cigarette lighter outlet in my truck and this silver part you see here is grounded. That's a negative ground. So when I go to do the test, I put my finger in this, I touch that so that I'm grounded, have a good negative ion charge. And that way with my other hand, when I hold the pendulum over this, if I get a strong swing like that, that tells me that there is a negative ion charge on it and my body does not want any more because I'm already flooded by what I'm getting out of that cigarette lighter. And so when I tested this, when I attached the wings and did the test, I got a negative ion charge on it. Despite the incredible claims and the profound implications of his work, Grebenikov faced skepticism and rejection from the scientific community. After his patent application in 1992 was denied, Grebenikov attempted to share his groundbreaking work through a book. This publication was intended to detail his discovery, outlining the principles and mechanisms behind his invention, supplemented by a wealth of full-color images and potentially including photographs from a museum demonstration of his device. However, in a turn of events that raises questions about the motives behind the decision, the publishers, potentially influenced by external pressures, significantly altered the book just before its release. This involved the removal of hundreds of images and all schematic details that were crucial for understanding Grebenikov's work. This situation begs the question, why was Grebenikov, already under scrutiny and skepticism from his peers, subjected to further efforts that seemed to undermine the evidence of his invention? A longtime colleague of Grebenikov suggested that he was part of a so-called scientific underground, which faced opposition and perhaps even persecution from the established scientific community and government bodies. Perhaps then, Grebenikov's inadvertent discovery was more profound and potentially disruptive than initially thought. It could be that his work touched upon a force or technology so significant that it was deemed too dangerous or too powerful to be allowed into the public domain, prompting efforts to bury his findings and silence the discussion around them. Nevertheless, Thomas Brown's work has continued to inspire scientists and inventors in the field of alternative propulsion systems. Perpetual motion. Victor Schauberger, an Austrian forester, naturalist, and inventor, spent a significant portion of his life studying the dynamics of water flow and natural energy. Born in 1885, Schauberger's observations of the natural world led him to develop theories and inventions that many have since associated with the concept of perpetual motion a principle proposing a machine or system that can operate indefinitely without an external source of energy. It's crucial to note, however, that Schauberger himself never claimed to have developed perpetual motion machines. Instead, his focus was on understanding and utilizing the natural power of the Earth, particularly vortices in water flow, which he believed could be harnessed for beneficial purposes. Schauberger's approach was deeply rooted in his observation of nature. He believed that modern technology and engineering ignored the harmonious principles found in natural systems, which, according to him, could lead to energy generation without the cost of environmental degradation. His famous aphorism, understand nature, then copy nature, reflects the core of his philosophy. Schauberger argued that water, when allowed to flow in a vortex, could create its own energy through implosion, a concept that stood in contrast to the explosion-based technologies like combustion engines, which dominate human technology. One of Schauberger's most notable contributions was his research into vortex dynamics. He observed that water in rivers and streams naturally follows a meandering spiral path and posited that this motion is essential for maintaining the water's vitality and energy. 
By mimicking these patterns, Schauberger invented several devices intended to produce energy or propulsion. His repulsin, for example, was a saucer-shaped machine designed to generate propulsion through a series of specially designed wave-like patterns that would create a vortex of air or water. This device captured the imagination of many, leading to speculation that Schauberger had unlocked the secrets of perpetual motion and free energy. His work attracted the attention of the Nazi regime during World War II, and there are accounts of him being coerced into developing his inventions for military use, an experience that reportedly left him disillusioned and wary of the potential misuse of his discoveries. After the war, Schauberger continued his research, but his inventions never achieved the commercial success or scientific recognition he hoped for. The controversy surrounding Schauberger's work intensified after he was taken into custody by U.S. intelligence agents and held for nine months. During this period, all of his documents and prototypes were confiscated, and he was interrogated about his inventions and his activities during the war. This episode has fueled speculation suggesting that Schauberger's innovations in harnessing natural energies were of such potential that they were considered a threat to the established scientific, economic, and political order, leading to their alleged suppression by the U.S. government. You are, mate.